All right. Hey, welcome to another edition of Mississippi Stories. I'm your host, Marshall Ramsey, editor at large at Mississippi Today. And our guest today is somebody I've known for a long time. Frankly, I have worked with him or technically for him probably for the last, oh, I don't know, 20 years. And somebody that I've always uh, liked, admired, and enjoyed having sitting down and having a conversation with. So I kind of thought, hey, why not bring him on Mississippi Stories and have that conversation so that y'all can hear it too. Very, very excited to have Ronnie Agnew on with us. He joined Mississippi Pub Broadcasting in August of 2011. Ronnie, there was no way that was 10 years ago. Yeah. That my mind after a 10 year stint at the Clarion Ledger and a very distinguished newspaper career before that. And we'll, we'll get him to touch on some of that as well. He is a Mississippi native. He's from Saltello, uh, Mississippi. And uh, your dad is still with us and still going strong. and. Yes, By God, you can tell that you are his son because uh, you, <laughs> you you and some of your siblings all match uh, match up real well. But, uh, Ronnie, thank you for taking some time out today to talk to us, and I uh, hope everything's going well. Well, things are going well, and as you said, it's it's been a long time friendship with you. You know, even even though that yeah, my, I might have claimed the title of boss, we were really more colleagues, uh, and that was so much fun. I mean, that was in the the, really the heyday of newspapers and I can't tell you that I, I will say that pound for pound I think we had one of the best staffs that I've ever worked with when we we're all together yeah and, I, don't, and, I, don't and think I still people, miss everyone yeah. too I, I do too and you know I mean that's a, I don't think people quite understood how special that time at the Clarion Ledger was because yeah. even though it was a, a medium-sized newspaper you know it wasn't the New York Times or it wasn't the Los Angeles Times or Chicago Tribune Pound for pound, I think person for person, we had some of the most talented journalists in that building and a lot of them were from Mississippi and every single one of them cared about Mississippi. And that I, what was it 2005 when editor and publisher named it the, one of the top um, newspapers. Yeah, we, we were, it was, it was called, a, it was called 10 Who Do It Right. And uh, that was a really good distinction because out of all the newspapers in the country at the time, newspapers were still very well staffed you know, maybe 50, 60,000 journalists in the country. And to be named uh, as one of 10 who do it right. I mean, that was that was really a nice honor. I mean, it really was. And and frankly, Mark, Marshall, we did it right. Um, we we had experts in every area of, uh, of coverage from people who were political experts to people who covered the the day to day grind of education and, and crime and 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 in the environment even we had an environmental reporter and i remember also sending uh sports reporters travel the country they covered the masters so yeah we did we did um we did things bigger than what we were um and we always thought that that was our mindset our mindset was not that we were a mid-size or a small paper or whatever by standards we were about 120,000 circulation when i joined the, the clarion ledger um, so we never considered ourselves small. We we always considered ourselves big, but not so much because of circulation, but because of the way we thought. I mean, we we put a lot of effort in everything that we did, and the people of Mississippi, I, I hope they benefit. I, oh, I definitely think they did. I mean, that was the year, too. I mean, Jerry was a Pulitzer finalist that year. I was a Pulitzer finalist. Jerry had won several other awards. There yeah. was just, I mean, it was it was a pretty cool year, and, and yeah. um and, and you're right, you know, people ask me, of course, you know, I mean, I, I feel this way about the staff, the team that I'm with at Mississippi today. I really love the, the, the energy, the passion that's there. But I always tell people when they say, well, do you miss working at the Clarion Ledger? And I say, I miss the people because it was like a family. It was a family. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I think that that bond will always be there. Yeah. You know, we see when we see uh, each other, no matter where we are, it's almost, it's like, a, it's like, you know, we, we pick up where we left off. Yeah. Uh, we had, we had such talent. We had Rick Cleveland. We had Bobby Cleveland. We, we had Billy Watkins. Yeah. I mean, we had Gary Pettis. We had you. Uh, we had Sherry Lucas, who was an expert in the arts. Uh, we had people who could pick up the phone, Sid Salter. Uh, we had people who could pick up the phone, pick up the phone and get anyone we wanted uh, on the phone. Uh, I'll never forget that. If I would go to Billy and say Billy Watkins and say I needed John Grisham, um, it was not that long. Maybe two or three hours later, we'd be hearing from Grisham. 
Yeah. And uh, this was at the top. And this is when Bish- Grisham has always produced best best selling books. And this and and we were getting him at the top of his game. And we could do that by you know if we needed Brett Favre when he was playing still we could yeah. get him. I mean we could get anyone we wanted because we have people who are so connected. And uh, not to mention the politics. I mean Sid, my goodness, what a what a asset he was in terms of bit in terms of getting people on the phone whether they're a Democrat or Republican, uh, I think they might've been afraid not to call C. <laughs> you know, I remember after Katrina though, I mean, he was able to pick up the phone and get, get Governor Barber on the line, you know, yes. right after the storm, literally, and, yes. and to find out so we could have a better idea what was going on on the ground. I mean, like I said, yes. it, was, it was a very, 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 very special time, no yeah. doubt. Yeah. It was fun. Yeah. But you came originally, you came originally as managing editor I and, did. Yeah. And uh, Sean McIntosh was the executive editor. She moved on to Atlanta and still there doing quite well. Uh, yes. Yeah. Great career there. And then you moved up to executive editor. And um, of course, you were over my boss, David Hampton, who I called the ego whisper. <laughs> <laughs> on that. I yeah. saw him the other day at the ball game. I was just like, it was so good. Yeah. Like I yeah. said, it's just like seeing family. Let's go back to the very beginning, Ronnie. I mean, you literally, um, you grew up. I was. I would say the suburbs of Tupelo, but that's probably not fair to Saltello. It's a, it's no. a whole, whole different planet on that. Tell what was it like growing up, and when did you kind of get that itch to to go into journalism? Well, I, I tell a story all the time, and you know, at the Clarion Ledger, it became quite the. Uh, <laughs> I had people who could recite it for me, but it's a true story. You know, my my mom and my father, they were sharecroppers. They're very very poor people, in, in Mississippi. Um, living in uh, less than you know, standard. I mean, the, the houses, I gotta tell you, they were they really weren't houses. They were yeah. literally shacks. And, uh, you know, we didn't we didn't need uh, David Hartman to tell us when it was raining, it was, we, we felt it. Uh, but our parents did the best they could. I mean, they they worked hard. They, 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 worked, in, they worked in the fields, they were picking cotton. And, uh, you know, even today, even though that was a tough life, when I talked to my 93 year old father today, you know, he still talks about bragging rights about how, many, how much he could pick uh, before technology. My father was picking. Now, keep in mind, this is a guy who was about five, seven, about 140 pounds at the time, picking 400 pounds of cotton, cotton a day. Oh, my gosh. I mean, wow. and then after the after he would finish that, he would go home and he would he would have a mini farm. He'd have a couple of cows. He'd have some pigs, chickens and everything. And always a garden, always a vegetable garden. So, you know, because he had kids, kids, one after the other, one after another. There is a 14 year gap between nine kids. <laughs> and so so my my mom, who, who is just no longer with us, man, I, yeah, yeah, I don't know how she did it. <laughs> And a lot of boys thrown into that nine too. Yeah, well, well, five five girls, four boys. Yeah. And I have to tell you that they were we were all born at home. Uh, my oh, mom wow. never my mom never went to a hospital to have a child. And uh, they back in the day they were traveling doctors. There was a doctor named Doctor Zubra, uh, who lived in Tupelo. He was the first African American doctor that I know of in Tupelo. Uh, and he um, he he delivered us. But sometimes Marshall he didn't make it in time. So sometimes, believe it or not we would deliver, some of us would deliver by our aunts, my mother's sisters. And he would arrive later just to check us out. So, I mean, you think about that. You think about not having prenatal care because they they just didn't know. And I have to believe that there were probably resources that were available to them. But when you when you don't have education, they, they were able to go to school part, part of the year and then they had to quit because the parents need them, needed them to to, uh, to go to the fields. And then later they had to go to the fields for themselves after they got married. But uh, I will tell you that having a mom who, and I have to say this, my, my dad is definitely supportive and he worked, he's a worker, but my mom is a visionary. I often wondered if she had a chance. I often wondered, I mean, if she had a chance to make it, what she could have done in life. Because as she was, as she was picking cotton, as she was toting that cotton sack, she was praying for us and she was saying that my children won't do this. I, I'm, I will not let my children do this. So in the 60s, um, the factories were starting to really come online for Tupelo. And my father went to, went to Tupelo to work at 
what was called Rockwell International. Uh, and he worked there for 25 years. Uh, and, uh, and that's when things started changing for us. I was um, four, maybe five years old when we moved from the, the squalor of the, of the shack to, uh, to, to a house. We rented a house from, um, from, from a physician who lived next door to us. And, uh, you know, my mama's dream started becoming real because we saw success. We saw what success looks like. And my oldest sister was able to you know, catch that bug about what she could be. And, and she ended up going to, uh, to, to college, actually, in, believe it or not, in, in Tennessee. She went to Knoxville College, which no longer That's exists, right. That's right. but it was in Knoxville, Tennessee. And she graduated from Knoxville College. And she's very proud of that today. Uh, but she started that long line of us going to college. Only one of us uh, decided not to go. So eight out of nine of us uh, completed college degrees and many advanced degrees. So uh, for out of uh, parents who probably truly, if you were just to, to really think about it, it was probably about a third or fourth grade education to send eight out of nine kids to college and give them that kind of life. And my brother's doing well, too, the one who decided not to go. He's doing extremely well. He's a pastor in Dupelo. Uh, and he's still working, uh, but he's doing extraordinarily well. So we're very proud of him. Uh, but they gave us a different. They gave us a chance. And uh, but the thing about me and how that helped me as a journalist and how that helped me and what I do now is, man, I have such empathy for people who can't tell their own stories. And that has been that has always served me well uh, everywhere I've ever been. It served me well and it serves me well here. I mean, because I have always thought that we could be the 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 uh, the voice for the voiceless, and we could be the the person who bridged the gap and who stood in the in the space of people who didn't know how to get there for themselves. Ronnie, um, when you decide to go to college, I mean, obviously you you could have gone pretty much anywhere. I would figure. What made you decide to go to Ole Miss? Well, actually, I couldn't. Uh, I really uh, I, I was limited. Actually, Marsh, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. Uh, back in the day, there was very little ACT prep. Uh, mm -hmm. If you took it, you just took it. There was no one telling you uh, that you needed to study, you need to get study guides, and there was no yeah. tutorials on it. So I didn't have a great ACT score, and um, and uh, I got some rejections. And I will say this, I've really never talked about this before. Yeah. I, I was very, very happy that to be accepted to Ole Miss on probation. They saw that I was like a, yeah. a 3.7 student in, in, in terms of high school. They saw yeah. that I was, the work was there. They said, something, something's not matching here. He, he, his test score is low and his GPA is high. So let's just take a chance on him. And so the first, the first semester I made the um, uh, close to the Dean's list or something like that. And, um, and, and I had a very, very successful academic uh, career at Ole Miss. Um, and, and that's, you know, I chose Ole Miss because I just, I just wanted to do something different. My, my family, and this is uh, really important to me, they all went to uh, HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. And I would always accompany them to those schools and just see what it was like to walk the campus. And, uh, you know, I just said to myself, I want to try, I just want to try something different. And uh, I am so glad I did. I mean, Ole Miss, is, Ole Miss has been amazing to me. Um, and it's really opened up doors for all the universities. You you know how this works. They call us all the time, all the universities. So it's not like you know we're 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 uh, we're just bound and to one school. I mean, yeah, you get calls from Mississippi State, you get calls from Ole Miss, you get calls from all these schools to do things, and and so do I. So you know, I think that's the thing that I'm really proud about is that having that opportunity to be in Mississippi to be a Mississippian and to speak to Mississippians, especially the young folks and, and coming through. Uh, and that's something that I've always prided myself on is to have that gift of really, really talking to younger students and trying to get them involved in journalism. And even though journalism has changed, uh, I, I really, I've tailored my message, but I haven't changed my message. I still think this is a very honorable profession. You do a lot of mentorship, don't you? I do, I do. I talk to a lot of folks and sometimes it's, it's crazy. Sometimes it'll be someone who will say, I heard you speak five years ago. And I'll, you know, I'll have to admit that I don't remember you, but, but uh, you know, I'll do all I can to help you. And uh, what's wonderful is to see someone get an opportunity 
because of me, uh, because I was able to be in position to put to make a call for them and 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 give them. I said, you know, let them succeed or fail on their own, but at least give them a chance. And uh, there are people all in newsrooms all across the country who uh, I'm so proud of. And I'll I'm gonna tell you a story that's poignant for both of us here. Uh, as editor of the Client Ledger, I'll never forget. I, I got a call from a friend of mine who was a recruiting editor in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, and, and there was a, a, a sports person that we had who they were sort of curious about. And they were saying, well, he, you know, he's, we, we, we've seen him work, we've seen his work, we, we think he's good, but do you think he can cut it in a market this big? Well, uh, th that guy's name is Saquon Smith. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, so, he, he cut it. He cut it pretty well. Yeah, uh, and so yeah. I mean, I, luckily, I don't even know if Seku knows this, but I mean, I, it, obviously he's he, he passed away, but I don't even know if I ever told him the story that a friend of mine and I cut that deal for him to get to Indianapolis, and then the rest is the rest is history. Yeah, I for mean, those who don't know about Seku, Seku of course went on to, to there and he went to Atlanta and, and covered the Hawks beat, and they've since named a scholarship after him and. And then he went to go work for Turner and is an MBA analyst. Absolutely. You knew when the guy walked into the room, into the building, yes, at the Clarion yes. Ledger, because he had this just yes. radiance about him. And it, it translated to television really, really well. And yes. unfortunately, COVID took his life. He, Seku lived real close to where my parents were buried. So I, the next time I was going to come back to Atlanta, I was going to go have lunch with him. Yes. And then the pandemic happened and I couldn't get over to Atlanta and then it took his life. But um, yeah, he, and that was the thing. I mean, you, you talk about the mentorship, but I mean, that, that a lot of people don't understand that, that so many people that worked here in Jackson have moved on to just huge roles in around mm -hmm. the country too. It was, it was a great training deal um, to be there. Let me ask you this, talk about mentorship. Were there any professors at Ole Miss that, you, that you feel like helped shape you or helped guide you to get you to where you are today? Uh, there, there's, a, there's a person right now, his name is Dr. Will Norton. Yeah. Um, and I know Dr. Will Norton has been through a tough time lately. I know there's, there's been some things written about him and I know that there's some, some, some you know, we won't go into to, to the, the details of that. Uh, if people want to read it, they can read it for themselves. But I got to tell you that not only me, but any person of color uh, he personally uh, took an interest in every person of color in that journalism school, and he was a dogged recruiter of people of color. He thought uh, that journalism should look like America, that, that the staffing should reflect America. And he reached out to us, and he made sure. I, I'll never forget uh, when I was, um, I was actually, didn't know what I want to do. I was kind of goofing off and and not doing the things that, you know, I was in his class and he was like, you got to, you can do better. I know you can do better. Um, and he pulled me to the side one day and said, you know, you got to get your act together. Uh, you, you know, I, I'm invested in you. And he was saying, I'm invested in you um, as, a, as, as a student and as a person who I see having great potential. And uh, I don't, so I don't care what they write about him. I don't care what they say about him. I don't care about how they disparage him for uh, having conversations. He had conversations with a donor who apparently used some, some tough language and uh, he's sort of being looped into, in with that. But that is not Dr. Norton. That's not who he is and that's, that will never be who he is. And so he, he will forever be my mentor. Uh, you don't know this, this, when I was at the Sun Herald, I, was, I worked for the Biloxi Sun Herald uh, as a 23 year old. And when I was 24, the phone ring, I've been there, well, I stayed there about two years. When the, the phone ring and it was um, it was uh, the Cincinnati Inquirer in Cincinnati, Ohio. Now, at the time, Cincinnati was about two hundred seventy five thousand daily and about four four fifty, 450, I think, four hundred fifty thousand circulation on Sundays. And they called me and they said, we want you to come interview with us. And I'm saying, wait, I'm at a 40,000 circulation newspaper. And uh, later to, I went on to find out that it was Dr. Norton to whom they called to ask about a top student who could succeed at the, at the Inquirer. And I ended up staying about seven or eight years in Cincinnati. And it took me about three years in to learn it was Dr. Norton who actually made that happen. Um, 
that he's never left me at, at every turn. He's always been here for me. So I will always be here for him and, um, and I'll do anything for him. Uh, another person who I, who I admire, uh, I, you know, people think I had classes with him, but I didn't, but I was around him all the time because he was just a mentor. And that was Dr. David Sansing. Yeah, who became okay. one of Mississippi's most noted historians. I had the opportunity to speak at his service after he passed away. And, um, and I talked about just being in his, in his presence and knowing that there was something special about this guy and how he took an interest in me and uh, not in his classes. I used to, I used to kind of hang around because he had a, he had a, he had a teacher assistant who I kind of liked. Wow. So, so, I, you know, it's all about a girl when you're old Miss, you know, yeah. um, <laughs> And so I would go with her, with her when he, when, when they were working together, and I just started hanging around him. And afterward, I would go, even though she wasn't around, just to talk to him. And uh, and uh, and another another was Doc, Dr. John David Cruz. Doctor Dr. John David Cruz gave me uh, a love of the language. He, you know, he uh, his sons are you know Billy Cruz and David Cruz have gone on. Billy was a longtime publisher in Tupelo for a while. And, and David has worked for the federal court system for a long time, but their dad was an English professor and he gave me the love of the language. I mean, uh, by the time I graduated from Ole Miss, uh, I had taken six classes from, from, uh, from Dr. Cruz, Dr. John David Cruz, and uh, it's special. And then when I get to Jackson, what, what happens, I meet his 90 year old sister, oh. who, was in, who was in St. Catherine's Village. And uh, she gave me, hell <laughs> wow <laughs> you know she every time that she felt like you know we weren't doing it doing our job as a newspaper wow. she would call up and say it you know john taught you better than that <laughs> so so and you know and and when she passed away man it was like a personal it's like it was like having a an old aunt uh pass away she was such. She was so dear to me. So I had I had lots of lots and lots of role models at Ole Miss, and I, I don't regret that for one minute. They they treated me so well. When you when you graduated, I mean, and I remember when I mean when I graduated, I wanted to be an editorial cartoonist, which was I might as well have wanted to be an NBA basketball player. The odds were about very similar. But I mean, so my path was a little weird. Did you did you have a path when you graduated? Did you know exactly where you were going, or what? Yeah, absolutely you not. My path was as convoluted as you could think. I was a broadcast major. I was a broadcasting and English major, and a sort of aimless. Um, and Dr. Norton loved my writing. Just yeah. absolutely thought I was one of the better writers, who really didn't have a print degree. I I never had a a, a print degree. So he actually. Uh, got me a job at the Greenwood Commonwealth, or, or he helped me get a job at the Greenwood Commonwealth, working for the legendary uh, John Emery. Uh, they called him J.O. And uh, John Emery always believed that in the Mississippi Delta, that he should never have a newsroom that didn't reflect a, the, the, the diversity of the region. Yeah. And uh, he was he was very very uh, uh, he was a, he was a great teacher. Uh, he was a great supporter. And frankly, to be honest with you, he put up with a lot for me because, you know, I had done uh, the English thing, but really not the journalism thing. And there was a different style of writing. So he had to, you know, he was patient and I appreciated that. So uh, every, everywhere you go, Marshall, there's somebody, and you know this, everywhere you go, and it's the, every step you take, there's somebody there to greet you at the door, to, to take your hand and say, I'm going to help you. Uh, and when you have that, man, it's golden. It really is. Uh, so, so uh, living in Mississippi Delta, also, I talked about uh, empathy. I talked about when I when I would go around and I'd do those stories in the really, really impoverished part of, of Greenwood. Um, that was empathy. Yeah. And you think about this. You know, here I am now. I'm, I'm the executive director of Mississippi Public Broadcasting. I've, I've been all around this state. I lived in Greenwood. I lived in Hattiesburg. I lived on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. And even though I left the state for, for a period of years, no one else left. So when I come home uh, to be a journalist at Clay Ledger, everybody's still here. And so the, the Rolodex actually was still good because 
people were still here. And uh, it is so cool to be able to call uh, the same people who were part of my life way back in the day. I had a great honor in 2019. One of the last things that happened in 2019 was when I was 21 years old. I, was, I graduated when I was 21 from Ole Miss. And I covered one of the first things that they assigned me to do at Greenwood was to cover something called the Greenwood Voters League. Well, Senator David Jordan uh, has been the longtime head of the Greenwood Voters League. And I covered it as a 21, and then I guess I turned 22 at some point. And in 2019, all those years later, um, gosh, in, from 1984 until 2019, uh, you know, I, they, they called me. They said, we want you to come back and we want you to give a keynote address at our annual banquet. So from a kid 22 with a notebook covering this, uh, this group to keynote speaker on the stage with uh, Congressman Benny Thompson and, and others that night. It was a special day for me. It was more special than they could ever know that uh, they had, I, I wanted to make sure that I made those folks proud and I want to represent them well and it was a, it was a, man, it was a magical night. You know, just hearing about that many people that have touched your life and, and changed your direction. I mean, you know, shaped and honed and got you pushed in the right direction. I mean, I completely understand why you do the mentoring that you do. Yeah. Almost yeah. sense of paying it back. Yeah. 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 You do that, you know, and, um, you know, I, I don't want to say that had been bumps in the road. I mean, they're, they're, everybody, everybody has them. I mean, and, yeah. and it's, you know, it hasn't always been great, you know, and I, I don't know if we want to segue to some of the tougher times, but, you know, when the yeah. uh, 2008, 2008, when the newspaper industry started taking a, taking, a, taking a nosedive and things started changing rapidly, and I was on the forefront of that. I was on the management team at the Clarion Ledger, um, and then all of a sudden, every quarter, if the company didn't perform up to what they perceived to be standards, Which they did. Uh, <laughs> I got a note. I got a note that said uh, I need five positions out of the newsroom, or I, I need six positions out of the newsroom, and and um, you know, of course, that was the uh, that that was the low point for me. I mean, because as you said early in our conversation, uh, they, that was family. Very, they, these people were family, yeah. and uh, to call a family member in and say, you know, I'm sorry. Uh, that was uh that was that was the toughest thing that even to date that's the toughest thing I've ever had to do. Hey, you and I sat across the desk from each other in that circumstance too. Thankfully, you helped fight to keep me there. And yes, I, I'm grateful for that. Um, yes, you know, and but it was it was a tough conversation. But you know, in hindsight, um, I think for both of us, it's turned out to be the best thing because we were able to continue to do what we do and and survive. Yeah. I think I went. I think there was like 17 rounds of layoffs when I was there. From the they top. were, you know, they would, they would come, and I'll, I'll never forget. This is a true story. I'll never forget being on vacation, uh, on at least three occasions, and you know, it'd be the end of the quarter or whatever, and I would get a note. But I was always told to take a laptop on yeah. vacation, and I would be told that we need to get, you know, four hundred thousand dollars out of news. So while my family's on the beach and enjoying the beach, I'd be in there trying to find four hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. So, um, and this is not, you know, this is not to be critical of, of Claire Ledger or, or the industry. It's to say that these are the, these are the real ramifications of change right. and media disruption. And uh, uh, I think it just caught the industry as a whole, not just Gannett, not just the Claire and Ledger. I think it caught everyone just flat footed and uh, in, a, in, a, in a defensive posture and, to the point now where we just, there's just not been recovery. Uh, yeah, I, Ronnie, I'm seriously, I'm just looking back on it. I mean, I think personally that we were so focused on the daily miracle. Yeah. Getting the paper out every day. And then the yeah. internet came along and we just said, oh, we'll just throw it out there for free and everything. And, yeah. well, you know, it was almost like we just didn't see it coming. And I say we as an industry, not you and I personally. Yeah. But um, I, I tell you what, I mean, and, and I don't know about you, and I think I've seen this with, you know, there's been a lot of change at Mississippi Public Broadcasting in the 10 years that you've been there too. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but in a way, I think you were prepared for that this time because we had just gone through it, well, what we went through in the newspaper business on this. At the end of the day, I, I think 
you know, any lesson that I tell anybody who's coming up, and I'm sure you tell the people that you mentor, it's like you, you have to learn how to be nimble, you have to learn how to be resilient, and you have to learn how to not, you know, fall in love with something. If it ain't going to work, you got to move on and try something new. Yeah, yeah. But you know, the thing that's good about Miss, Mississippi Public Broadcasting is that, you know, it's a, it's a place where we can try things. Yeah. And, and, um, and, and, and give them a shot and see if they're going to work. Uh, when I got here, Marshall, there was, there was a Mississippi edition, which is our newscast, mm-hmm. uh, radio newscast. And there's also the nine, a nine o'clock show. Yeah. And after that, maybe a 10 o'clock show, but after that, it was a classical music sequence. And, and I, and, and we made, and a lot of public broadcasting stations were doing exclusively uh, classical music. Mm-hmm. And I just had this vision and along with the radio director. And he came to me and he said, we, we need to shift. We need to make a shift. And it's going to be, it could be controversial. Uh, we need to shift to more local programming. Yeah. And so we would add one show, then we would add another, and then we would add another and another. And now we have 15 local radio shows, including now we're talking, the featuring Marshall Ramsey. Um, and I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud. And we also, you know, basically have a, a way for people to listen to classical music too on our on our music radio. Uh, so it's it's a win win for everyone. It's a 24 hour classical music thing on our dot two station, and uh, but our primary station is 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 focused on local. I mean Mississippi, pure Mississippi. People tell us all the time that. You can't get more Mississippi than, than than our than our radio shows. Deep South dining, eating. We love to eat. Yeah. Um, you know, we we have a show. We have a show called the Stalk Gardener. Whoever would have thought a gardener gardening show would get as much attention as it gets? Uh, we just went on a eleven or twelve uh, uh, stop tour with Felder Rushing, and I got to tell you, people were just lining. I mean, they were there. And, and, and they tell me, I didn't go to the coast, but they tell me that the event on the coast was in a, in a downpour and about 60 people came out. And, and a, I mean, so that just lets you know the power of what we've done. And we've solidified our audience on, on radio and we're doing the same thing with TV. I'm very proud to know that during the pandemic, we, uh, we knew we had to make some changes and we knew that uh, education was gonna be the key because kids were the most affected. So, we basically created another channel uh, that you can reach with just simple, with a simple antenna without having cable. And we call it uh, MPB Classroom TV. And now we're in partnership with the Mississippi Department of Education. And I got to tell you, I'm so proud of that because now we have taped, recorded in excess of 500 segments. Every single day, there are teachers here recording more segments. Uh-huh. And uh, you know, the thing that we got to do now is we have, we have to market a little better, get people out there realizing it, knowing it's there, but it's it's got uh, content from K through 12 uh, content. So, yeah, we it's there. Uh, it's going to be there. MDE uh, has given us a grant to keep it going. And that's fantastic. That's one of the things that we had to do. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a mobile thing. It's an evolving thing. That's what you have to do in media. You have to continue to evolve. And, uh, and that's what we're doing. And now we're back in the field with our television shows. Uh, we are Mississippi Roads, which is our top show, by the way, with Walt Grayson. Our folks are back in the field with that. Um, and we also are about to start recording Fit to Eat, which uh, features Chef Rob Tyson. And I say those two shows because in addition to having those two shows on MPB, those two shows air nationally on Public Media's Create channel. So we have two shows right now that are airing uh, every week on nationally and have a national audience. And, and that's pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I always tell people, I think pound for pound, the content that comes out of Mississippi public broadcasting, I mean, yeah. especially per dollar is yeah. just off the charts of so the documentaries. And, you know, I mean, I've, the people that I've had the pleasure of working with doing conversations on the TV side. And of course on the radio side doing now you're talking have been as good as anybody I've ever worked with. And oh, yeah. They're just, it, it's once again, there is a love of Mississippi that comes through yeah. on, on when you turn on the dial. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's some plans right now that are really, really preliminary. But man, I tell you, if they, if they come through right now, I am, I am rooting for this because 
if these plans come through, and, and I'll just tell you one of them, I don't mind telling you one because it's something that that, that uh, it looks like it may happen, and that is uh, we may have full cooperation from the uh, Micker Evers family for wow. to do a significant documentary on, on his life. Um, and um, that's in the works right now. We, we've gotten some commitments from the family, and um, I, I'm, I am so excited about that. And it's going to take us a couple of years to complete it because we want us to, to do it in conjunction with, the, with, I guess, with the 60th anniversary of his death. Yeah. And um, so that's one that, that's that's in the pipeline right now that we're working on. And we're also working on another music show that we can do. We we're trying to, we're in negotiations with my friend and your friend, Bobby Rush, uh, uh, to tell his story in a different way. Um, and so... Uh, we, you have to keep, like you said, the media, you have to keep innovating. You have to keep trying. It's, it's never done. It's never, it's never done. And, you know, as executive director, my job here is to make sure that the people have the resources to do, resources to do the job. And I'm, I'm very, I'm very pleased to know that we've been successful in a number of ways and, and securing some funding, state funding and grant funding to really do some work that frankly just wouldn't, 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 wouldn't be able to get done. Yeah, tell us, a, just explain a little bit how public broadcasting is funded, because I think some people think that 100% comes from the state or, you know, they, they sometimes get mis, you know, construed a little bit on where the funding comes from. No, public public media is funded through Congress. Uh, right now, it's at a level, I think it's a full, about $475 million through Congress. Think about that, $475 million to fund an entire system of 400 plus NPR stations and about 250, 270 uh, PBS stations. That uh, that money doesn't go very far. Uh, it equals about a dollar thirty-two per taxpayer. That's about as far as it goes. That's why most people. That's why all stations have to raise more of their own money. Yeah. Uh, and in Mississippi, you should know this is this is what's really cool about Mississippi. It's only one of sixteen, maybe twenty stations in America that has a statewide reach. Yeah. that has infrastructure that reaches every every home in the state and so we are every every state agency the out of those 16 to 20 stations all of us receive state funding um and you know there there have been to be honest there have been uh, there have been many conversations about you know cutting funding to mpb and you know ever since i've been here there's, there's been at least three or four uh early bills introduced to uh to take our funding um given you know with the thought being that you know that was a time when before all the all the choices on television but i have to tell you the pbs and uh, is holding its own it's uh it's like the seventh rated uh highest rated uh network in the country in prime time oh wow um and that's that's significant if people saw the chart of, of where we're rated they would they would be surprised and say that wow but you but you look at the content though uh from the national folks and they're they're producing some significant things. The Kim Burns stuff is, is always excellent. He's about to do Muhammad Ali. That's going to be huge. You know, he did country music, and he made country music really interesting with a really really strong Mississippi presence yeah. that we had in that. And you know, and then we had Dr. Henry Louis Gates, who just did the Black Church. Well, you you know that the historically Black Church in Mississippi is strong. Uh, so there's such a, a natural tie, a national tie from. What the people that uh, what PBS does and 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 how it connects to us because what we try to do is we try to latch on to some of the things that really speak to Mississippi to do companion pieces uh, and tell their stories and and we've been really successful in doing that during the Vietnam War which also Ken Burns did we held uh, and you helped us with this that's right we we, got helped, we held uh, events throughout the state yeah and uh, I mean to see. I had I had one lawmaker's wife come up to me and hug me, and tell me that she that she had never heard him speak about that war. Really? And he was on a panel. He was yeah. on the panel that I think I moderated that night. But uh, she had never heard him talk about it, and she wanted to thank us for getting for learning about her husband's uh, the ordeal in Vietnam. And uh, it was that was a very and you went with us to Ocean Springs that time and it was very moving, very emotional time. Yeah. Um, if you if you're not moved by that and and when you see these veterans who you see the looks on their faces and it's just like it was yesterday, um, 
then you, you understand the importance of the work. You know, one of the few conversations I actually didn't host since I've been part of it, we, Kim Burns was in town and yeah. Bruce Covington interviewed him at Roanoke. And yes. there was just this great surreal Mississippi moment of Bruce playing Faulkner's piano with Ken yeah. Burns watching him. I've got a video yeah. of that. I was like, yeah. but I, you know, when you left Mississippi, did you think you were going to come back? No, I wasn't coming back to Mississippi. Um, I, um, uh, I love Mississippi and, and Mississippi was great. And, um, but I, I had made the decision that I, you know, my career was trending upward. Uh, even from Cincinnati, I was giving, I was getting, I was getting opportunities to, you know, maybe not be hired by these folks, but I was getting opportunities to at least interview with, with the likes of the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal and people like that. And, and I'm not, so, you know, I'm thinking, you know, this may work if I just keep working on my craft, maybe they'll not just interview me, but they'll hire me. Um, but something just clicked. And, uh, and I, I started having kids. <laughs> <laughs> it that always works doesn't it yeah you just can't move them out of schools for some no years. no they were babies i started having kids and i said uh you know my wife said if we don't go and they offered me a chance to be managing editor in addisburg and that did and and that was the night at the very end of 1993 and we decided that if we don't do this now the kids may never know their grand grandparents yeah. and uh i i just thought Oh God, why are you doing this to me? Why are you, you know, because it wasn't because of coming back to Mississippi. It was because I left the newsroom with 250 to 275 people to go to a, a newspaper that might have had 150 people working there, period. And so I was like, okay, you walk in and you say, hmm, where's everybody at? Uh, Marshall, that turned out to be the best thing I'd ever done. The people of that community are still some of my dearest friends. They embrace me fully. Uh, uh, again, they let me make mistakes. They let me learn. But that is where I really, really started coming into my own as an editor, uh, and really got confident that I could, I, I could operate and do this at a very, very high level. Uh, it happened right there, and uh, moved from there to Alabama, which. Really, they they got the benefits of what I learned in Mississippi, and uh, and I stayed there for about four years, and that's when I got the call from uh, our dear friend, uh, the late Bill Hunsberger, who was the president and CEO of the Clarion Ledger, to uh, to come back. He called me along with Sean McIntosh, who was at the Atlanta newspaper, called me, and they said, "We want you to come. We want you to talk about the, the managing editor job." Uh, but Sean, I believe this, I don't know if she's ever, she has ever said this publicly, but she always told me that she wanted to be an investigative editor. And that's exactly what she did. Yeah. She said, one day you'll have this because I want to be an, exec, uh, an investigative editor. And in August of 2002, that happened. I became the executive editor of the Clarion Ledger. And uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a great moment for me and my family. Did you? Ever, every, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, but everything leads to this. I mean, that's the thing. I did that for nearly 11 years to, uh, you know, and then, you know, to have the opportunity, I just wanted to change after laying so many people off and not seeing, not seeing the end of that. I just said, I just want to get off the train for a moment. Maybe I'll go back, but uh, you know, it frankly just got worse. And so, um, and that's when MPB came about. And I mean, it's just been nothing but growth here since I've been here. We have done uh, I, I think we have put ourselves on real solid ground. I think we've got res the respect of the industry and um, and it's not me. I tell people all the time, it's them. I, I let managers manage. Um, I let people, I, I let people uh, you know, come up with their own ideas, come up with their own projects. And obviously I have a lot of content in me because of my background. So I'm able to, to, to supplement and augment things, but it is their show. Yeah, you know, Ronnie, I, I was thinking about you have always been involved in different groups and um, like for instance, I mean, you've judged the Pulitzer, what, four times now, I think? Something I did like the Pulitzer four times, yes. Yeah, I mean, you're on several boards and, yeah. and, and head of groups and so forth like that. Yeah. Tell us some of the things that you do now, because I think 
a lot of people in Mississippi probably don't know that you have a pretty big influence nationally as well when it comes to public yeah. broadcasting. Yeah, actually, it's, it's been get really nice. I've been on the a bit I've been on the PBS board of directors, the national PBS board of directors, uh, for six years. And if you would have ever told me growing up in that little in those conditions and then coming out and only having two channels on the TV, which was NBC and PBS, and learning so much from PBS as a, as a kid, as a very, very young child. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's amazing how PBS was my teacher. It was my first teacher. Um, and so I'm on the PBS board of directors. So I, I just pinch myself when I go in that room with all those, what I consider to be really, really smart people. Uh, and I'm also uh, the chair of the PBS diversity committee. Uh, it's a big deal because of all the things that are happening in the country right now. Uh, so that that job has become elevated. Um, I am also the PBS editorial standards committee, basically editorial standards, meaning that we are always trying to be fair, always trying to be equitable, always trying to make sure that be, be an inclusive. So we're, we're all we're doing well all about that. So and, there, and there's a lot of other things that I'm doing. I'm on the I'm on the board of the American Public Television. Uh, organization, which I just rolled off as chairman, mm -hmm. and they're the, they're the largest distributors of public media content outside of, I mean, in the entire system. They provide more, more content than anybody for PBS. So uh, I've, I've had about every, in 10 years, it's been an accelerated 10 years because I've been chairman nationally, national chairman of, of uh, most of the organizations, which, I mean, I'm, I've been on the stage more than I've ever would have thought, and I I always say the good Lord has a sense of humor. This guy who grew up to be so shy, I was so shy growing up in, 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 in the early days of my life that I never thought that I would be able to do the things that I do now. And um, I, I'm just grateful. I'm grateful. It's I'm far from finished. So I don't want to say this is over. It's not. I'm far from being done. I got a lot more I want to do. But uh, to this point, it's been, it's been great. Well, I've known you, like I said, for 10 years, I worked with you at the Clarion Ledger. I've worked with you 10 years at MPB. Where do you think the next 10 years are going to lead you? Next 10 years is I want to keep making sure that public media grows. I found an industry that I love. I found an industry that really kind of needs me. Uh, I think diversity is an issue in public media. I think that I can help with that. I think that we only have about five or six uh, general managers who are African-American across the country, across those 270 stations. Uh, I'd like to see those numbers increase as well as the number of women who are leading stations increase. Yeah. So I'd, I'm, you know, I'd like to lend my expertise in those areas. Mm -hmm. I, I still am very much involved in, in, in the editorial standards portion of it. And you gotta understand the editorial standards governs all the, of the independent producers and anyone who's producing content for PBS. And so we are we are definitely working hard to make sure that they meet those standards, meet those. Yeah. It took us two years to develop uh, a comprehensive list of that. And so and I've done webinars, uh, I've done everything. So but locally home at home, you know, and I'm sure that at some point we'll meet again. Mm -hmm. But locally, I'm on the boards of, uh, of, of the Ole Miss State Journalism School, the Southern Miss Journalism School, Jackson State. And I recently just took a board appointment with the Overby Center at Ole Miss. Oh, so, uh, congratulations, yeah. Yeah, I backed off a little bit because I had so much going on nationally. Yeah. But now it's time to, I'm rolling off some things nationally, so now it's time to come home and, and to, to, to lend myself to my folks at home because my, the, the home folks, are they, they will always come first. You know, speaking of um, the home folks, I know that, and you've, you've won a ton of awards. You've had a lot of honors. I mean, yeah. Getting the silver M though, that had to mean an awful lot to you. Uh, that, that's of course given by the Ole Miss Journalism School. Um, that had yeah. to, that had to be a very special day for you, didn't it? Yeah, it was the 50th anniversary of the silver M was the one I got. And I just, uh, you know, it was just a great, great night. My dad was there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I always wanted my dad to, you know, to understand. And, and I don't know that he really can grasp the, the what his hard work did for us and, you know, what it, the position that it put us in, you know, the biggest regret Marshall and I'll do this without being emotional is that my mom died at 54 years old after developing uh, uh, a real serious heart condition. She had uh, 
uh, and and she yeah. and she died when she was 54 years old. So she didn't get a chance, and that's one of my biggest regrets. Because she didn't get a chance to see me do uh, any of the stuff and the sacrifices that she made for me. Um, I would have loved to pay her, pay her, paid her back, and not in money, but just in love and just being there and showing her just how much I appreciate what she did for me when she was dreaming, toting that cotton sack and praying and dreaming at the same time. Uh, that that's what she did, and uh, it's it's uh, that's uh, that's one of the things I think about all the time. I have a feeling she knows. I really do. And I'm glad your dad's gotten to see everything too. I know, you know, it was cool for me that my dad got to see because when yeah. I was eight years old, I walked up to him and said, I want to be a cartoonist. And he just yeah. kind of patted me on the head and he said, you'll be the best one ever. And then he got to see me become one. And I always thought that yeah. was a cool moment too. So yeah. yeah, you got to meet dad too. I always thought that was kind yeah, of- Yeah, I thought that I loved being here. I did. I, I definitely cherished those days. And, yeah. you know, of course, meeting your sons, I mean, they were- at at one point, uh, 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 David was like my son, <laughs> the middle child. He was like mine. I mean, as a little kid, he would come to my office and he would just he would just sit. And uh, at two and he years old, he could, he could speak in complete sentences, and he would come into your office. My yeah. oldest son, who was very shy, would yell at people, you know, to get yeah. away from him. But you, he would come in, and you two would just carry on a conversation. Yes. And I bring him in right now. He's out cutting the grass right now. He's about to go to journalism school. So uh, it is funny that also uh, Maddie uh, Pettis, Madeline Pettis, she would also come in my office and just sit. And I was like, "What is what is?" about this office yeah. and then Antonio Mack Francis yeah. who was our, my assistant at the Clarion Ledger who now works at MPB as an artist exactly. uh, as a seven-year-old he would come to my office and just sit and I was like what is going on and Jameis said a, uh, a walker who is now working for Gannett again yeah. uh, in 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 the in the Hampton Roads area uh, gosh her kids would come I was like what is going on <laughs> I was like, I don't understand this. And they would just sit. They didn't care if I did, they didn't care how busy I was. So I would just turn around and talk to them and just felt in love with those kids. And to see them excel now, to see what Daniel's done, Marshall's Marshall son Daniel and what David's gonna do, he's already just blown everything out of the water at Madison Central. Uh, and we just, I just can't wait to see what the future's gonna hold for these kids because they, they were extraordinary then and they're extraordinary. They got, they're going to always do big things. I can't wait. Yeah, I think, I think you know, he and I, he and I talk about it. Of course, you know, I, I've always joked that whenever they pick up a crayon and start coloring, I'd slap their hands to get them <laughs> to stop. You know, I didn't want them going into that. But, I, but you know, they, they like storytelling and they understand that this is the best yeah. way to do it. And I'm so grateful yeah. that you're here in Mississippi and you're, you're out there still making sure that our stories are getting told. Well, keep in mind the day that Rick Cleveland found out that Tyler, his son Tyler, was going to major in journalism, he said these words, and I hope it's appropriate. He says, "I think I'm going to go outside and throw up." <laughs> and but but that young man has become, I think, one of the best journalists in this state. He is doing. So, I mean, Crooked Letter Sports Podcast is doing. Yes. It. He's out there. Yes. And yes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it lets you know that. It's 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 the drive inside of you, yeah. And and Rick's Rick's got it, and his kid certainly has it. Would you? I mean, did, did your kids ever want to get into journalism? They did not. My my family is a, a family of educators. The, all those people I named that went to college, they were more mostly teachers. And yeah. my kids wanted to be teachers. They wanted to follow after their aunts and uncles. And um, they are they are teachers. I have a daughter who's a a seventh grade math te math teacher in Gulfport, and a son who is a uh, eighth and ninth grade English teacher at in JPS Jackson Public Schools, so uh, that's what they want to do, and I, and I hope they're happy. I have a daughter who was a uh, has an MBA in accounting, uh, but she wants to, she wants to be in ministry school, so she's out in Fort Worth, Worth Texas, pursuing a, a a ministry degree. So right now, so they they're charting their own path, yeah. and uh, and and I have to allow that, and I have to just be you know I'm, I support them fully in whatever they whatever they choose to do. They've given me four grandchildren. Uh, that's funny. I look, I'm too young for that, I know, but <laughs> <laughs> but that it's a reality. They have, and uh, it's now part of my story. It's now part of uh, who I am. And uh, but like I said, this is uh, you're right. I mean, a lot of things have happened. I look at the resume, and it's got a lot of stuff on it. But a lot of stuff is attributed to you guys, to all the folks that that made this happen at MPB and 
and throughout the newspaper world. I mean, it's it, the, the sheet, the stuff that's on this paper is, is not me. It's, it's work done through a lot of other people, and they did it with excellence. They did it with uh, professionalism, and I'm I'm just saying that it's a uh, it's been a it's been an extraordinary journey that I hope you know ends on my terms. That's the thing about our industry, Marshall, and you know it is that you know yeah. is that's uh, that's never been that's no longer a guarantee. Now there's no gold watches anymore in our business. No, no, no. We just had a friend who said he's retiring. His name is Ernest Hart. Yes. He's, oh, he Ernest is going to retire. Yeah, he, he works for the Sec Secretary of State's office. Yeah. Uh, but he told us by in July this month, yeah. I think this week, I think the 16th of July, he is going to call it call it a career. Uh, he worked many years. I mean, what thirty maybe or more at the Clarion Ledger. And then for the last eight or so for the Secretary of State's office, and he is uh, so. The, and he was a, he was our he was our uh, uh, managing editor for graphics at, at the Clarion Ledger. So uh, you know we do. Uh, this, is, this is a tough. This is, this is a tough uh, uh, career, and you do hope to finish on your terms. Um, and I hope to finish on mine. When I started out as a janitor, I can always go back to being a janitor. That's how the way I've always looked at it. Well, you know, I'll, I'll figure something out at this point in my life. I've, you know, I don't worry about that anymore. I'll just have to figure, you know, we've always figured it out and we've always, it, we've always made it work. And, uh, and um, that's no sense worrying about that kind of thing. Uh, I, I read Matthew 6, 25 through 33 all the time, which says, take no thought for your life. That's what I say. Uh, and, I, and I don't. And it says, what does, uh, what good does worry do? Worry yeah. doesn't do any good. So. You got to get out there and do something. You got to get up. He would always tell me that when I would come into your office, Francis that, Mack. That's right. That's he right. Says right in the Bible, you can't be worried. And I was like, you can't be worried. And so that's what I'm saying. So you can't you can't fret and worry over that stuff. And uh, I've seen too many people bounce back from setbacks, and all those people, those 30 people or so, who I had to say goodbye to. Every I'm telling you to a person, everybody bounced back. Yeah. Everybody got a break. Everybody bounced back, and they finished strong. The, you know, so uh, I'm proud of that. Very, very proud of that. Well, thank you, Ronnie, for taking this time and talking me, with me today. It's just good to, I mean, the, the, the best thing literally about doing the radio show is that I get to come into the, and now I'm back in. I, my, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I did my first in-studio uh, radio yeah. show in over a year and a half. And so that yeah. was with Bobby Rush, which was just pure gold, just getting to yeah. talk to him. But it's just nice to be able to come in the office and chew the fat with you. So this is this has been in fun. It's been fun. I appreciate you for asking me. And uh, you know, like I said, people need to know that we love what we do. Yeah, it's inside of us. We're very passionate about what we do. And um, I, you know, I just wouldn't change a thing. I just wouldn't. You know, the the ups and the downs, and there have been some some significant downs. Yeah. But you know, we're we're survivors, and we we persevere, we press forward, and that's what we do. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ronnie. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you, man. All right. All right now. Thanks.